Thank you so much. And welcome everyone. So we are here for the Literary Salons for Teaching Artists, Unveiling the Art of Publication, workshop number two. And I just talked about one of our incredible resources of the Teaching Artists Guild, which is our regional networks. And that I wanna highlight um, one that has so many dots on our asset map, which is Tag of California. As I mentioned, um, it is regional based and that network includes teaching artists and art administrators with varying years of experience and expertise representing regional arts organizations, educational settings and community social service organizations from across the state. It's a strong, well-equipped network of professional teaching artists in California. So tag of uh, California, as I like to call it, is building public awareness for the value and the role of teaching artists and community, sharing best practices and resources for delivering quality arts education experiences and advocating for the professional status of teaching artists. So it's really wonderful to see so many California-based teaching artists like Joanne and Jean that are present today. So thank you so much for being here. Now, why we are all here is to celebrate the incredible Jean Johnstone. But before I ask her to take the stage, I would like to read her bio. And um, I, I was so delighted in um, learning about Jean's artistry and journey. Um, uh, Jean Johnstone was also the co-executive director of TAG. Um, so it's just really wonderful to hear about someone who was also in my shoes. So Jean Johnstone specializes in arts and cultural policy, education and workforce development issues and international comparative cultural policy. Ooh, that's a mouthful. She teaches the arts and cultural policy class at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. And she consults on projects related to this work recently, including California 100 Project, which develops forward thinking policies for the state of California for the next generation and for the Economic and Workforce Development Department of the City of Oakland. Prior to this work, Jean spent seven years as the Executive Director of the Teaching Artists Guild, um, TAG, and she worked in partnership with County Offices of Education, the Department of Education, Philanthropies, and statewide on national policy councils for arts, education, and labor issues. Prior to this, Jean was an actor, a director, and teaching artists. Yes, she is multi-talented. She has lived, worked, and trained in Hong Kong, Moscow, and the San Francisco Bay Area. She holds a master's in public affairs from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, and both her BA and postgraduate degree in theater arts from University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you so much, Jean, for being here. And we do have a special guest that will be joining us later. Um, I will be reading um, Michael's bio after we hear a little excerpt from Art for Policy and Policy for Art. Hi, That's Jean. my cue. <laughs> that is your cue. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's so great to see your faces. This is marvelous. Thanks for joining us on this uh, blustery afternoon um, slash evening, depending on where you're located. Um, well, Carrie, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I guess I'll just dive in. Um, I'm going to be reading from this article that uh, Mike O'Hare and I uh, co-wrote uh, together. And um, uh, yeah. Here we go. All right, so um, <clears throat> as you gathered from the bio, well, I um, moved from uh, working in the arts and uh, arts administration and, and so on um, to the public policy world, which some people are a little surprised at, but for me are completely intimately connected. And uh, when I met uh, Mike, well, he understood that too. So um, anyway, this is based on a class that uh, Michael taught for um, many years and which now I teach um, in arts and cultural policy um, at the Goldman School, UC Berkeley. And uh, we thought that it might be good to um, tell people about what we were doing because um, these were exciting connections for us and uh, we wanted to share them. So, um, okay, here goes. The arts and public policy 
intersect in three dimensions. As is well known, a multitude of direct subsidy regulatory and support programs advocated and managed as arts policy influence artists and their encounters with audiences directly. Tax law, public education, public health, housing programs, and other government and nonprofit behavior putatively directed to other purposes, but also greatly consequential, are also greatly consequential for the arts and culture. But we claim, less conventionally, that public policy of all kinds needs the insights and guidance of artists, without whom we cannot understand the society we live in, or even who we are. Our purposes here are one, to share a course framework that other schools might want to adopt and adapt, two, to illustrate how the art to bridge policy, uh, art to policy bridge can carry uh, useful traffic both ways. Um, over four decades, O'Hare and more recently Johnstone have offered a course that introduces these interactions to a diverse enrollment, mainly structured around the conventional economic and political elements of arts policy, but informed throughout by the art to policy connection. In the following pages, we describe the three main areas in which art and policy jointly create value and then describe the course itself as an expansion of the standard policy analysis model. From art to policy and back again. Arts policy could be taught like a typical area course, like health policy or environmental policy, um, by simply presenting the main ways that policy affects the arts. And the course mostly follows this path, but we think art creation and engagement have distinctive contributions to make to policy analysis itself. And we emphasize both directions on the bridge between government and art. In 1996, Murray Edelman analyzed such a bridge between art and politics and found that art is the fountainhead from which political discourse, beliefs about politics, and consequent actions ultimately spring. In our course, we extend his insights to policy analysis itself. What does art have that analysis doesn't? First of all, the experience of art is cumulative and very broadly sourced. Engagement with policy is usually linear and stovepiped as when we prepare our income tax returns without much thought about how much we paid last year, what the government is doing with our money, or the urbanistic consequences of taxing real estate. Policy analysis hews closely to the data on hand and the defined body of research. In contrast, the more art you have engaged with, the richer the next experience will be. And we draw on all our life experiences when we encounter and engage with artworks. This embrace may be uh, understanding references to other embedded works, such as Tom Stoppard's use of Oscar Wilde in Travesties, La Boheme as a basis for Jonathan Larson's musical Rent, or A's music sampled on a track by B, but it might also be our own experiences of the world, the appreciation for a certain color or place, the remembrance of a scent triggered by a sight. These memories are all part of our experience of new art, and this accumulation feeds the continued conversation in which each artist and audience member participates. Economists have modeled art engagement as a beneficial addiction because the utility of each unit of consumption increases as more is consumed. Second, and following directly, art engagement is an active process. Neither vision, the physiological act of viewing, nor hearing is objective or passive, but subjective experiences, both individually and biologically, which do not result in all viewers seeing the same thing or a given thing the same way at all encounters. Physiology, um, how humans see compared to other animals, such as range and detail on kinds of light and color. Psychology, what we think we are seeing, our interpretation of what we see, and behavioral science, what and how we focus our attention and how this can almost literally blind us to what is actually happening before us, are all at play here. Seeing may be believing, but it does not, as it turns out, objective truth make, and neither does reading an excellent double-blind study report. 
A third is that art is a context in which to see that economics, the queen of policy science, is not, as students are liable to wrongly think, about money any more than carpentry is about inches. Certainly money is inseparable from art policy and the operation of art worlds. Baumol's cost disease, whereby art becomes constantly more expensive relative to goods that benefit from productive, uh, productive efficiency gains is not comprehensible without economic thinking. But economics is actually the study of all finite resources and attention time is one of these. We only have 16 waking hours a day and a lifetime of days. And the value created by an hour of attention to anything that could have been directed elsewhere depends not only on the object, but on set, setting, and multiple dimensions of the viewer's background. These concepts inform our understanding of the arts and culture within our current economic system and the valuation of other public or quasi-public goods. They also help us to think about the development of culture and public opinion. If culture is a space where differences in human experiences are shared, enriched, blended, and negotiated to some sort of agreement about how we function in relation to ourselves and others in society, an understanding of how we percept and how our attention to any given object creates value is an important piece of the discussion and artists have always been central to it. I'm gonna pause there for a time check from the lovely Carrie Warren. Woo! That was incredible. If you can, please unmute, gives Jean Johnstone some love. You can also share some emojis. I know that um, this publication was not created to be a performance piece at all, <laughs> but it's really incredible to hear the words that you wrote. Please share in the chat um, a word waterfall of something that stood out to you from this um, reading. Um, for me, when you said taxes, I was like, oh yeah, I don't look at my tax report in that way. So like, I'm just, and maybe it's because taxes are coming up in April, um, but that would be the word that I would type in the chat. So I'm going to put taxes, but what other words or images or quotes, um, feel free to type them into the chat. Or, um, if you are so brave, um, you can raise your hand and speak them out. I see context from Jeannie Taylor. Yeah. Assessing attention, exclamation point. Yes, Jeff, absolutely. And as those trickle in, Jean, how did that feel to um, speak it out loud? I'm sure that this piece you have edited over and over with Michael, like I'm sure that you, your brain has seen these words over and over again, but what was it like to um, verbalize it? Um, really bizarre because we have, um, we have presented this material, but we've presented it as a, um, well, you know, with slides, with artwork, with charts and things like that, and, and um, essentialized points. Um, and it's a completely other process. Uh, so it's, it's a mouthful. And it's also actually really enjoyable as a writer to be able to do that. So thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Yes, that's wonderful. Well, um, before I introduce your co-writer, Michael, I do want to um, do a little bit of a poll just to see who we have in the room. Um, and uh, one question that I would love for you to think about, Jean, is how you would define a teaching artist in your region. Um, so uh, bear with me while I launch this poll. All right, so you will see um, a pop-up on your screen or tablet or phone. And there are four questions. Um, they are yes or no, not sure answers. So the first one is, are you a teaching artist? Um, so you can answer yes, no, not sure. The second question is, are you a writer? Yes, no, not sure. The third question is, have you been to a TAG event before? Yes, no, not sure. And the fourth one is, have you ever worked in the state of California? And I have a hundred percent yes. Oh, I have two people from California. All right. Four. <laughs> Amazing. We do have a lot of writers. Everybody has answered yes to writer. We've also got um, some teaching artists in the house as well. That is incredible. Awesome. I'm just going to give 
some more moments just to see everybody can fill the poll. All right. I'm going to end the poll and share the results so that you can see who else is in the room with us. So yeah, we've got teaching artists. We've got 100% writers. <laughs> Everyone here is a writer, which I love. Um, uh, and a lot of people who have attended tag events before and some people that are new. So welcome to the Teaching Artist Guild. And um, some people that are from California. So thank you for showing up. Amazing. Awesome. So Jean, how would you define a teaching artist in your region? I'm going to come join you on this so you don't feel so lonely. Sure. Fantastic. <laughs> Floating out there is this um, huge <laughs> I'm calling in from New York. And um, I know that you've also been based in New York before you understand that there's five boroughs. But when I go to a teaching artist gig, I take the subway. And sometimes I blame the subway for uh, making me late or I have to walk up many different steps. Um, uh, one school in New York, the drama class is on the 11th floor. So I am always asking um, a security or a teacher for the elevator key. So I'm wondering what it's like to be um, within arts education or a teaching artist in your region. What that could be. Oh gosh, um, I would say in direct opposition to that experience um, and to other very large, dense cities that I've lived in, being a teaching artist in California is a lot of schlepping over longer distances. Um, you got to have a car. You got to be able to go from one city to another city, thirty miles away, in one day and unpack and all these kinds of things. At least that's that's my experience for sure. Do you ask me um, before, what is a teaching artist? Like, what do I think that is? And um, I was coming up with my standard response as a former executive director of TAG. Um, but then you put that poll up and you asked, are you a teaching artist? And I was kind of floored. I was like, oh my God, am I still a teaching artist? I don't know. I am. Um... I think so. I think <laughs> once a teaching artist, always a teaching artist. It's, it's an identity. A career I that's fluid. But again, yeah. people can define, you know, um, I'm coming from a theater acting background where I know a lot of people that have stepped away from the profession, mm -hmm. you know, but I still would say that they would mark, yes, they are an actor or perform, you know. Um, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense because I'm not currently practicing my art form, uh, but that doesn't ever really leave me. Um, and I continue to work um, in roles in education and bring that with me actively. Um, so I guess I still am. We're going to go with yes. I'm going to change the unsure to yes. I love that. Amazing. Um, so another, um, so now I would love to bring on Michael. Hello, okay. Michael. Thank you so much for patiently waiting. And uh, before um, uh, I ask this question, I do want to just share um, uh, your bio. Um, so Michael O'Hare trained at Harvard as an architect and engineer. He came to UC Berkeley after teaching positions at MIT and Harvard's Kennedy School and real world employment at Arthur D. Little Inc. Boston's Museum of Fine Arts and the Massachusetts Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. His research history has included periods of attention to biofuels and global warming policy and much more. But one thing that Michael really wanted to share with this community of teaching artists is that his mother was a sculptor, Berta Margulies. And Michael, one thing that I did forget that I didn't get to type in was that you had a teacher who was also an artist. Who was that teacher of yours? Can you share that with us? Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger. So you come from a very artistic background and I, I know you shared the story with me and I think it would be just a really great way to also share with this community of artists that intersection between arts and science or arts in a different you know form of like lawyer or finance. I know so many artists that change careers or um, not even change careers. They just go in and out of maybe their arts profession and they might become a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, head of finance. And so um, you had a really incredible story about um, one of your teachers who was a, a musician that I think was just really poignant and just would ring true to a lot of the people here. 
Um, oh, sure. Um, well, so I'm, I was trained as my first professional education was as an architect. Um, and I, I would be reluctant to call myself an artist, teaching or not. But on the other hand, I have taught a studio course in policy design. That is the design of non-physical environments is the way I think about it. Um, and uh, design, design issues come up in almost everything I've done. Uh, the best way I can, <laughs> the best way I can describe my experience. And by the way, Pete Seeger learning, learning down with every two songs from Pete Seeger was a wonderful experience. But he was a terrible music teacher. We learned nothing about music. We just learned to sing the songs. We didn't learn harmony. We didn't learn ensemble. We just sang along with Pete. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I value the experience, but it, it could have been fairly different. Um, so the the story I was telling, um, I'll try to give a short version of it, is of a, a very uh, a very interesting colleague that I had when I was at the Kennedy School <clears throat> named Ronald Heifetz. And if you all are looking for more stuff to read, his um, first book, uh, most important book is called Leadership Without Easy Answers. Um, Ronnie was a, uh, when he was in college, he was a cellist with a look at a professional career. He was a Piatigorsky student. And also his father was a doctor and he had to decide if he was going into medicine or music. And in the end, he opted for medicine and became a shrink and developed a practice uh, as a psychiatrist in stage fright for musicians in Boston. And the more he got into this, the more he thought, well, performing is kind of like leadership. You're up there on the stage and the audience is expecting you to help them do work. Um, where can I learn about leadership? And he wound up knocking on the door of the Kennedy School at Harvard and asked, hey, can I learn about leadership here? And he asked the guard at the door, and the guard was completely nonplussed and pointed him at a professor who was going by, who happened to be Thomas Schelling, one of the most important economists uh, <clears throat> of our era, the late Tom Schelling. And Schelling realized that the answer is you can't learn about leadership at the Kennedy School. We really have a big problem. So we invited Ronnie to come and get a one-year master's degree to get acquainted at the end of which he asked for a job and we made him a lecturer. And since then he's run a very important leadership program. And I think he'd be the first to tell you that all of that um, had its origins in his uh, practice as a musician. So incredible. I love that intersection. Thank you, Michael. So my question for both of you is that you co-wrote this article and um, I think there's this stigma or um, belief that writers are, you know, solo individual artists, you know, they just kind of go into their cabin and write whatever they need to. So what was it like to publish this report and really highlighting that this was a collaboration of writers, a collaboration between you both? So what that process was like, and if it was, you know, more beneficial, what, what that was like, the experience? Jean, you go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, gosh, um, well, we got to work on this class together. Um, and so to me, it seemed like a natural extension of that. We were already, um, collaborating in this way. And, uh, I learned a lot, uh, coming into, um, to a policy school, um, a lot of that from Mike. Um, and so to, to, um, get the chance to, um, uh, teach with him and to delve into this material, um, was a blast. Um, and then to find somebody who was as excited as I was about this intersection, um, was a joy. So I don't know how we even began where we got the idea or what, but we just started throwing ideas back and forth, made an outline and, you know, kept at it. Yeah, I, I, I don't either remember 
when this turned into a paper. Um, I remember when uh, when I was teaching a course and looking for a teaching assistant, and you popped up, and uh, in my usual uh, extensive uh, <coughs> extensive and intensive hiring practice review, I read your resume and I said, "Oh yeah, she <laughs> hired." You do it. Okay. This is up. And he's like made to order. Uh, and uh, so then we taught the course together and then I retired and uh, was relieved to say, well, I've finally got somebody to leave this to. Um, and Jean's been carrying it on ever since very successfully. Um, in the meantime, we're doing other lower, lower intensity projects uh, that are uh, related to it, I guess. But yeah the, yeah, the paper was fun to write. I think there's stuff about lonely writer, um, Carrie, no offense, um, is almost entirely wrong. Uh, being an artist is a social process. Even if you're alone in the studio, if you didn't have an, an audience, at least an audience in mind, you're not an artist. Uh, you're doing something else. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's it's a private entertainment. And furthermore, it's it's been my lifelong experience that good writing is rewriting, and the best rewriting is from colleagues. So almost everything I've written actually has been co-authored. I wrote a book with my wife, and I wrote another book with two other professors, and uh, most almost all, I think almost everything I wrote. Uh, when I was in my biofuels period, uh, was also with co-authors. And I think it's the only way to go. I, I, don't, I don't think there's much prospect for painters collaboratively painting, except maybe on murals. But for writing, oh yeah, pass it around and write on it, you know, and, and edit. And beat it. That. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm just going to put into the chat a little blurb from the publication that Jean and Michael um, wrote. Policy making process for the arts, a question of great interest for art students in particular is how is policy toward the arts made and how do I put my or in? So um, put that in the chat, please read the rest. And I would love for both of you just to respond about this section. Um, why it was added into the report, um, and also uh, the title, you know, Arts for Policy, Policy for Arts. Um, so just curious as to um, coming up with that title, but also this piece. Oh, gosh, uh, where to begin? I think, well, the easiest question to answer is the title. I think Mike came up with that because I'm really bad at short, pithy things. I have like the, you know, the two sentence title, and this is where it's great to have a co-author, right? Because you hand it over and then they essentialize that. And you're like, oh, good. well, I didn't really think of it. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but as for the actual section, um, so what we do in the article um, is uh, kind of, you got the intro from me, essentially. And then we talk about um, who uh, attends this course um, and how we teach it. We talk about the pedagogy and uh, how we try to utilize a pedagogy of the arts within our um, you know, university lecture hall or, or you know, whatever we get. Um, and then we talk about what, and we break down um, all of these different units from the syllabus. Um, and um, this is one of them. And it's one that attracts a lot of, of attention from um, a particular group of students, those who are very interested in, in arts policy. Maybe they're, they're artists themselves or in arts administration and so on. And they are here because, gosh darn it, how do I change things? How do I move these issues? I want to know you know, how, how do we how do we solve these problems? Um, so that is a portion, but only a portion of um, the whole course. Yeah, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Um, well, one an example we use, I think it's in the excerpt, is um, uh, resale royalties. Um, visual artists thought for quite a while that it would, if they could only get, if they could only get some of the appreciation of their work after they sold it the first time, when a collector buys it and they and their career really takes off, 
that would be really great. So there's legislation, uh, which I think is still in effect in California, that entitles artists to 15% of the appreciation of a work in the hands of a collector after the first sale. Um, and uh, this, <clears throat> this made the advocates and lobbyists in favor of it feel good, and it looks like a pro-art policy. But its essence is basically to transfer money from poor artists to rich collectors and to transfer risk from risk, rich collectors to poor artists. And if you describe it that way, and if you understand it that way, most people say, wait a minute, that, both of those sound like really bad ideas. Um, but you have to understand a little bit about economics and, and how the market actually works uh, to see how this is really quite wrongheaded. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, shoot the dogs is one of the, one of the short versions of policy analysis is to shoot the dogs and you know, find the bad policies and get rid of them. Um, and so that's, that's an example that, that is often interesting to the students. Mm -hmm. Uh, taxes, taxes are super important and not always in the way, not always in the way people think. Um, my uh, first book was about the effect of the tax deduction as a, an artist subsidy scheme, where rich, uh, rich people make contributions to museums and theaters and whatnot, and then, the federal, and then they pay less taxes because they deduct it from their income. Um, and that turns out to be the largest part of American art subsidy. It's comparable to the direct subsidies that European countries pay to arts institutions. And nobody knew that until we actually found some data and wrote it up. But it has real consequences because the tax deduction makes rich people's money easier to spend on the arts than poor people's. And so they tend to direct arts institutions the way they want. And that may not be what society really wants from the museum or the opera. And that that all flows from tax policy. From the, why is it a deduction instead of a credit? Well, that's worth thinking about. Wow. Well, speaking of policies, um, I uh, know that both of you are in the state of California, and there was a big Proposition 28. Um, I put the link in the chat for those of us that might not know about it. Um, I'm curious about your opinion. I know that um, uh, I am not asking about an expert opinion whatsoever. Uh, uh, it's more of what are your thoughts or your experience with Proposition 28? Did you, were you for it? And maybe how it relates to you or the teaching artists that you work with or um, within arts education. Um, uh, I think it's just to have a conversation about policy and this, pol you know, this was very recent in um, the state of California. Oh boy, um, it's a great question. And um, yeah, so Prop 28 uh, channels suddenly um, millions of dollars to arts education, uh, to uh, K through 12 uh, education in uh, the state of California. And, um, it's great. Um, it's fantastic to have that because one of the major issues in arts education um, is a, a problem of, of uh, resources, scarcity of resources. Um, and I will go out on a limb and say, even as one who um, uh, was constantly advocating for more money specifically for this stuff for many years of my career, um, but money isn't the only one, right? Um, we have the issue of, of time in a classroom. And um, a lot of times arts education gets pushed to the side as an elective or as a whatever, you know, as a non-essential course to make room for these other classes that are deemed um, core and essential and these kinds of things. Um, and so that's an issue too. Um, now that there's suddenly money for this, uh, how will those things balance out and how will people schedule them and so on is, is an interesting question. Um, so it's fantastic. But the, the interesting thing, okay, the interesting thing about it to me as a policy 
person now with that hat on is is um how it was written by whom and how it's being implemented um it didn't go through um uh arts education groups advocacy find a legislator or whatever right this is something that was put directly to the people um as a proposition and voted on um it was very exciting but there wasn't some of this um public scrutiny and back and forth that you might get on another piece of, of uh, proposed legislation on a bill or whatever. So um, you have uh, all of these interesting little um, issues that are cropping up as um, agencies in the Department of Education try to implement this. Um, really interesting questions about who this applies to and why um, and how much of this money is for what and um, uh, teaching artists have been um, really concerned that they're left out of this because they're talking about this is for um, certified arts teachers. Um, so the initial read on that was, okay, just if you're a high school drama teacher, right, or you're the, the classroom teacher of that subject in a school, that's where this money goes. And then there's also the problem of the pipeline because we don't have that many um, certified arts teachers in the state of California. And there's this whole backlog um, just recently. Well, I guess, uh, Carolyn Carr, you could speak to this. Um, not that many years ago, uh, were programs to de developed uh, to support the credentialing of uh, drama teachers in particular and dance instructors, dance teachers. Um, it it uh, wasn't part of, um, of uh, California regulation that these kinds of teachers could be credentialed. You had to have an English credential to teach drama, for example. So you've got all of these pipeline issues, you know, backing up as well. So suddenly we've got mil like almost a billion dollars to spend now and not enough teachers to do it. We got to figure out where in the day this is going to happen um, and what else gives and how these things move around. Um, you've got all of these like really complicated pieces and arts organizations who have um, for um, many years now, for decades, come up alongside to help um, schools uh, support the arts in their classrooms, kind of going, wait, am I pushed out of this now? What's my role? Where do we go? Um, do we still have a space here? Um, so all of these interesting questions that um, were never, I don't think I was not in on this process, um, really thought about initially that now we all have to figure out. Um, so, you know, devil's in the details, but overall, yay, money yeah. for arts education. Wow. And there's, there's some um, chatter in the chat of being like, you're very heard, like a lot of the questions that you have and um, that background information is also um, being, you know, uh, uh, shouted out in the chat. So thank you for um, sharing that. And I, um, I, you know, I, it's just really wonderful to have these candid conversations about things that are happening right now with teaching artists, with our community. So thank you for being so um, open and sharing within that. Um, I'm going to put something in the chat, which is a link to a um, new publication. Um, and uh, I'm going to bring Michael back on to share what this is. Um, let me know in the chat if you have trouble accessing this document. Um, and uh, it is a, a new uh, publication or it's a work in progress, but I'm going to let Michael and Jean share a little bit more for our last um, we have about, I would say, five minutes to share within that, so we can leave some room for questions. Okay. <laughs> well, this is our working paper from the conference. Not not published yet. Uh, but we were, were just rejected in a really interesting manner <laughs> when talk about the writing and publication process. Yeah, I mean, um, if 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 you were. Uh, if you think your ego needs to be beat about the head and shoulders, academic publications is uh, an excellent place to start. Uh, but I, you know, theater people, you go on stage and next morning you read the paper and see what the critics said. This is not an unfamiliar experience. Uh, yeah, so this is this was extending things that we realized in teaching the in teaching the arts policy course. We said, hey. Um, you know, not only is there a lot to say about policy for the arts, and not only does the arts 
do the arts sort of tell us something about policy if we pay attention? Actually, it's a policy analytic tool. If you, I mean, artists, uh, as I think in the in the uh, excerpt Jean wrote, artists are the people who tell us who we are, and who we want to be, and that and the criteria for evaluating public policy is like step three of a classic prescription model that we use in, in most of the public policy schools use. Um, how, okay, so what are you going to look at about a policy to decide if it's good? And there's and there's a fairly standard list. Um, but I think in, in the public policy business, we haven't paid enough attention to what artists can teach us. And they can teach us a lot, not just political art, um, but also more general and more abstract things, and also how to think about complicated issues when uh, when a statistical analysis of the data doesn't answer your question, which is usually, I guess that Jean is that a is that a pricey of yeah so I think that's... write it up. We said okay, we're going to take this public policy textbook, go through the eight classic steps, and and try to show in every case where paying attention to the arts can help you do those steps. And um, and uh, I invite everybody to read it. Yeah, here's the list. <laughs> the formal framework is in the chat here. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our, our case is that, that arts, all different arts, are gonna help you at every one of these steps. Yeah. Not just to- yeah, absolutely. We uh, this after we finished the first paper, uh, we thought, oh wait, yeah, this is this is uh, this is really the the substance here. So we were immediately pretty much inspired to do this um, this new paper, which we did get to present at a conference this summer um, down in Brazil, and um, uh, I am hoping that um no I'm not hoping we're doing this um but we're we're uh, going to turn it eventually into a book um but currently we're we're shopping it around um to academic uh journals uh for publication which is a whole interesting process that was pretty new to me up until the last you know couple of years so I everybody we showed it to has and I think unless there's somebody I don't know about, everybody we've showed it to have said, yeah, well, that's really interesting. This is a good paper. So we're encouraged and we're plugging along. Would love your feedback. Amazing. Yes, and if you, all have, if you all have comments and advice, please send it along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our uh, emails are uh, on the uh, PDF there or the drive link that you sent, uh, Carrie. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, some work in progress, as well as doing a deep dive into arts for policy and policy for art. Um, I do want to take um, some time if there are any questions um, from our participants here for Jean Johnstone or Michael. Feel free to raise your hand or um, pop it into the chat. Hi, Nicole. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. And I've been in and out with bad Wi-Fi. So if someone's already addressed this, then just uh, let's go on to the next person. Um, I'm curious about mentorship and forming, um, well, support for putting out a piece to meet um, a proposal or grant, um, you know, out a framework and um, your best advice for soliciting um, readers and um, mentors, maybe ongoing or just a one-time thing for a piece of writing in the arts ed world. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. That's a really good question. Um... I just, I just always ask Jean and I get to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can ask me. <laughs> um, um, I uh, this doesn't seem like a very professional answer, but I really rely on the people 
around me uh, to to give me feedback or give me ideas about where to go. Um, sharing ep- excerpts um, and and um, asking for feedback and and um, uh, not being shy about that process because I know that when I uh, when somebody comes to me and asks me for feedback or or to read something or or for a connection, I am always incredibly happy to do that for them. So um, while I feel um, self-conscious about uh, acting, asking for it, which may or may not be your problem, totally me, um, I've had to, to tell myself that, uh, no, actually, this is something that people love to do. This is how that work engagement begins and how I learn more from it, too. So I just start asking. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Finding your community, finding mentors, finding friends that can give constructive feedback and thinking of training programs. um, There are a lot of- Eric, could I just say one one more word on that? Um, The greatest, the the biggest obstacle. So in in our business, in the academic business, we have two big jobs and one of them is research and the other is teaching. Um, in higher education, you're expected to do both. And um, it's been very striking for me that research is highly collaborative. We exchange each other's papers. We uh, review them for publication. We uh, go have coffee in the common room and talk about what happened in the lab. Um, It's really intensely collaborative. Um, And teaching is intensely isolating. It's the most isolating profession conventional college teaching. And um, if we could just watch each other work more on that side of the business, um, I think we'd all get much better at it. And to institutionalize that process, I mean, I remember in architecture school when the professors would come around in pairs and look over our shoulders and we'd hear them talking to each other about what we had done. That was really interesting and really interesting for them instead of having what we call a state sage on a stage one professor standing up and lecturing uh to a, a room full of people taking notes so that um community the a sense of community and and i think more generally the traditional pedagogy of the arts um really has a lot to offer the rest of the academic system Absolutely. Yes. Community. The, so it makes me think of the asset map. It makes me think of um, the National Advisory Committee. And I see Jeff is here. And it also makes me think of the Entertainment Community Fund um, that has a really great sense of community. And Joanne, I see you have your hmm. hand raised. Hi, Joanne. I had a, I had a question um, and, and, a, and, a, and a, something that I've been thinking about a lot. Let me just lower my hand so it's not like base here. Uh, One of the things that I have found is that um, uh, we train teaching artists, you know, from, and and then we, we, because we're in a career center, we, we help connect them with job opportunities. But one of the things I'm very aware of, this is for the artist and not just the teaching artist, but in California, and I'm sure Jean, you'll, you'll understand this completely. Um, it's art can be very transient people can be very transient they move around a lot you know it's like it's like uh it's they're off to the next bright shiny thing you know that's in front of them and um so it's hard to create a pathway in your own career as an artist actor a writer director whatever it is you, you do um but as a teaching artist to be able to be consistent and to be able to really have opportunities available to you, you have to build something, you know, for people to come to. And I was thinking that publishing is a great way to, um, you know, during those spaces, you know, in between where you could really start to develop your arc uh, toward your, your, when I'm thinking about arc, I'm thinking about your own career story, you know, with the combination of teaching and publishing, you know, and 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 staying in in there, you know, and being part of something. So that's something you can put in your resume. It's something you can connect with new people on uh, uh, of what you're doing, and 
and uh, be part of another aspect of the community. Does that make sense in the way that I drew that up? Yeah, absolutely. It seems like a, a, a definitely a good opportunity um, for people. Um, I don't know if I can answer any questions. If there's a question in there that I can attempt to answer, but I loved hearing that. Yeah, it's yeah. a great idea. I think the question is uh, just um, how we can let people know who are getting trained to be teaching artists, you know, these options that are available to them. I think that's my question, you know, and where can they go to be able to develop those muscles mm -hmm. so that they can be, um, so that they can be good. That's the question, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I'm hearing yeah. what, you, what you've done, yeah. but what would be their next jumping off space right. to be able to be with those people that are doing that kind of work? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. There are so many holes in the system sort of as a, as arts workers, um, we, we, um, have to be transient a lot of the time, right? We go to the next gig. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Um, so we've got to rely, I think on, um, strong, um, service providers like tag and other networks, um, to try to, you know, become stronger, uh, to, to, uh, to be able to link people and resources, um, and we need a better way to share um, what people are are uh, doing, I think. Um, and all of those, I mean, all of this kind of goes back to to work at TAG, uh, to trying to connect folks in institutions as artists um, across education systems, all of these things. There's just, there's so much there um, that can become stronger that would help solve that exact problem. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a collaborative lift for sure. Yeah. Well, it's just that people don't automatically know where to go to be able to get the help that they need. Yeah. And it's possible because we have a lot of people that are really good writers. You know, they're excellent writers. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just I just wanted to get some some yeah. idea. That's that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you for being here. Um, I am going to just share a few things before we get to the rest of our questions here, um, but I do want to be um, uh, aware of our time that we um, have gone over. Um, one thing that I did share in the chat is that we have four more literary salons, um, and I put a promo code in um, the chat so that you can attend these for free. Um, uh, we have one tomorrow with James Miles, and then on Valentine's Day with one of our NAC members, the 20th and the 23rd with Eric Booth. So please come join us for our literary salons, and thank you so much for being here. Um, please give another round of applause for Jean Johnstone and Michael O'Hare. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Oh, my gosh. That was fun. That was really fun. 